All right. This will be a beautiful time for some of you up there to sleep. In his I'm watching you, though. All right. Isn't God good? Yes. Let's give him praise. Come on, man. about this. I feel like a little house on the prairie or something. <laughs> it is a glorious thing to be in the house of the Lord today. Amen. And I'm so glad that each of you are here. I wish I could see all of you. But uh, I know that uh, God is going to bless. Coming on the first day of the week, it is the Lord's Day. But not only is this the first day of the week, this is the first month of the year. You know, first things are important to God. Uh, Jesus is the firstborn of God. We're supposed to give the first fruits. We're supposed to give the first part of the day for sure. And so I'm confident then that when we tithe the first month, as it were, to the Lord, that God just blesses the rest of the year. So I'm excited that you're here. I know it's going to be good. One of the reasons why we're having our Bible conference in January, where we take four or five services just to preach on the blessed Word of God. Mark Thrift, it's going to be a wonderful time. Now, I don't know, are we online today? No, just recording it. Okay. <laughs> I was going to greet our online folks here, but uh, well, I'll still greet you, but it's That's after right. that. <laughs> <laughs> Wish you were here. <laughs> Amen. All right. That's right, Pastor. <laughs> All right, we're in the amazing book of Revelation. I'm sorry we don't have uh, screens for you to uh, look at things that would be probably a, a little helpful. But uh, So that just means you're going to have to really listen closely. I'll try to be a little more um, punctual in my uh, outline, but I hope that you'll follow. Uh, we are in, and if you have the little papers there, uh, I don't know, if, and I'm going to take the online uh, is working either to put it on your app notes, but so I'm not sure what's going on. But anyway, uh, so just listen real close, write some notes, I don't know. All right, so we're in chapter 14, we're in the second half, and the title of today's message is A Blessing and a Crushing. And you'll see why we use that term when we get to that wine press of God. It struck me as we've been going through the book of Revelation. Now, the book of Revelation is a book of contrast. There are many evil things that, strangely enough, are just opposites of the good things that God is doing. For example, as we know, very clearly there is the Lamb of God. But not only is there a Lamb, there's a beast in the book of Revelation. The Lamb was slain and then was risen. And likewise, the beast was slain and also arises from his deadly womb. The followers of the Lamb have a number on their forehead, and the followers of the beast also have their own number, 666. There is a trinity very clearly in Scripture, in the book of Revelation. There's also a trinity of evil. There's the beast, the false prophet, and the dragon. It's interesting how that in the book of Revelation, truth is set up by the false things that we see. Like a diamond, for example, that is set on a beautiful black velvet. God's love, therefore, is just made that much more wonderful and evident as we go through the book of Revelation. That's why when we read this verse in chapter 14, listen to it, it says, Blessed are the dead. That's the verse you're going to read in just a moment. <laughs> Chapter 14, blessed are the dead. You're going to say, what? how in the world could that be? Well, that's one of those contrasts. Normally, we would not put those two phrases together, being blessed and being dead. But that is the ultimate contrast. Our culture avoids death at all costs. Our motto would probably be, as humans, cursed are the dead. But God says, blessed are the dead, or Actually, the word happy means, the word blessed means happy. The exact opposite of what this world would say. Blessed 
and living sounds much more reasonable and <laughs> certainly more appealing than uh, blessed and dead. But in God's upside down world, especially during this tribulation period, the good life, the God-filled life is a study of contrast. And so here in the book of Revelation, it informs us of all these wonderful signs. Now as we go through the book of Revelation, especially some of them seem so graphic and so harsh and so even scary to some people. Actually, it's just God's way of warning us and just reminding us that with God, nothing is impossible. God is a God of victory. God takes things that even look bad and turns them for good. It's amazing how as we go through the book of Revelation, we are reminded to just keep on keeping on because God wants us to keep his word. He wants us to be blessed. And as we do so, God just has wonderful things ahead for us. And so today, a blessing and a crushing. Are you ready to go to heaven? That's really the theme. Yeah. A teacher asked her Sunday school class, preschool Sunday school class, how many of you would like to go to heaven? All the kids raised their hands, but little Tommy. Tommy didn't raise his hand. She said to the little fella, she said, you don't want to go to heaven? Why don't you want to go to heaven? He said, I'm sorry, but I can't. My mom told me right after Sunday school, I have to come home. <laughs> well, I hope that today you're ready to go to heaven. And uh, I tell you what, after that windstorm last night, I'm telling you what, right? we ought to be ready for sure. Well, uh, this morning, Jesus is coming soon. And as we go through yes. this uh, uh, chapter 14, things are going to really begin to turn because we're kind of at the last end of the tribulation period. Uh, the things are going to begin to really come to head. And God's judgment is going to be very clear. Well, let's pray. Father, thank you for this opportunity to be here. Lord, I'm excited to be here. I'm thankful, Lord. I'm grateful for all these wonderful people, faithful people, Lord, here. Don't mind, Lord, uh, having to go out to the outhouse or just not even have some coffee, Lord. Thank you for that. And I pray that you'd uh, just be with us today. Holy Spirit, meet with us. Touch us. Thrill us. Uh, fix in our heart how great you are. In Jesus' name. Amen. In all of the tribulation period, especially in the second half, the fury of Satan is unleashed in a level never known in all of human history. In fact, in Matthew chapter 24, verse 21, our Lord Jesus lamented in his earthly ministry. Here's what he said, for then shall be great tribulation, such as not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be, and except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. The days in the tribulation period are the worst of days, and there have been some terrible terrible days in the world's history. In fact, as Jesus said, the days of the tribulation, especially this last portion here, are so severe, so terrible, that unless God were to just shorten it and Jesus to come, that in fact even the elect or those that are born again by the blood of Jesus would be overwhelmed. Now we come to this beautiful reminder in Revelation 14 and verse number 12. Satan is trying to destroy the work of Christ. And yet, no matter what Satan throws at these wonderful tribulation saints, remember now, these are men and women, boys and girls, young people that have gotten born again during the first part, the first year, second year, third year. There are two witnesses of God preaching the gospel. There is an angel preaching the everlasting gospel. 144,000 Jewish men just preaching their heart out the gospel about Jesus. I mean, the world is just aflame with the preaching of the word. It just so struck me last week as I was studying, what is the one thing this world needs? The gospel. What is the one thing the world needs in the tribulation period? 
the gospel. And that is the greatest truth of all. Friends, if we did nothing else but spend our lives just passing out tracts, trying to do what we could to tell someone about Jesus, it would be the greatest thing we Amen. could do. But look at verse 12 now, Revelation 14 and verse 12. In fact, let's read verse 12 and 13 together if you can. Hopefully you can see what you're doing there. Got your phone out or your pad there or your Bible. All right, ready? We're going to read uh, as we do from the King James Version. And he begins. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. All right, we're going to read verse 13. Are you reading it or am I not sure? All right, let's try it. Verse 13, everybody read it, okay? And if you can't read it, just say it by memory. All right, here we go. Verse 13. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works to follow them. Here is the patience, verse 12, of the saints. The word patience. Hupamone, I think is that word, something like that. It just means to be steadfast when you're under something. Constant, persevering. These saints will endure with steadiness. Under the most relentless and vicious persecution in the history of the world. And they will be rewarded. How will they be rewarded? It says they will be rewarded. Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord. Now let's look first of all, if you're writing an outline, you can just put down number one, the blessing. Number one, the blessing. Write that down. <laughs> put it in your mind. All right. Put it up on the screen. All right. You will notice they are blessed. Why? Because bullet point number one, they live steadfastly. They live steadfastly. Look what it says in verse 12. They keep the commandments of God. That's why they are blessed, because they live steadfastly for the Lord. They keep the commandments of God. One of the great characteristics of these tribulation saints is unswerving loyalty to the Word of God. Many will die very painful deaths, but they will be so blessed because they live godly, God-fearing lives. What does that mean? It says they kept the law of God. They followed God's commandments. They were unashamed Bible believers. In John chapter 8, Jesus looked at a fledgling group of believers. He looked at them. They were kind of just getting started in the things of God. John chapter 8, verse 31, Jesus said to those Jews which believed on him, if you continue in my word, if you follow the commands, then you're my disciples. Indeed, you're a real disciple, a real follower. If you love the word of God, you love specifically the commands of God, the law of God, then God says, you are continuing in my word. You know, our precious children here in Sunday school, the children's church, they sing a song, which is an old song, but it pretty much nails this verse to a T. The B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the Word of God. The B-I-B-L-E. Do you stand alone on the Word of God? Is the Bible the final authority in your life? Yes. Now the book of Genesis says, male and female he created them. A kindergartner in Life Training Academy knows the Bible says there are only two sexes. And they know more than those educated eggheads from DePaul <laughs> University, America's largest Catholic university, where now when they enroll, students can select one of nine different gender identity options. They are not standing on the Word of God. Now, our precious children are standing on the Word of God. God's law says there's only two. People say, well, that's hate speech. No, that's truth speech. Right. <laughs> that's yeah. common right. sense speech. Look, friend, there, is, there should be nothing in the Bible that offends you. That's right. Let me say that again. 
if something in the Bible offends you, you've got a problem. Yes, sir. And I will tell you, you should never shrink back from anything that God says. Why? Because the Bible says the law of the Lord is perfect. Yes. You say, well, what about all those violent stories in the Bible? What about all those strange ceremonial laws? What about them? Look, the fact of the matter is, this is God's holy word. Here's, here's how I treat those things. I just say, this is God's inerrant word. I accept it. Now, I may not understand it fully. I may not be able to wrap my head totally around it. But at some point, I know I will be. And I also know that no matter what's in that passage, there's something for me. Now, it's true it may not be to me. It may be to the Jewish people, like some of those ceremonial laws. But all of the Bible is for me. Nothing should offend you in the Bible. These tribulation saints loved the Word of God. They stood on the Word of God. And no matter how much misinformation the Antichrist is going to throw at them, we have now certain states who have misinformation officers. There's a misinformation uh, whole group, I think, and the, uh, our administration want to say, folks, that is nothing compared to what the Antichrist is going to do. And yet, no matter what all the, the fake news that comes their way, they're going to say, I stand on the B-I-B-L-A. I stand alone. And I can stand alone. If nobody else stands with me, I'll stand alone. They live steadfastly. How do they live steadfastly? By keeping the law. And number two, by demonstrating loyalty. Verse number 12. It says they not only keep the commandments of God, but the faith of Jesus. They keep the faith of Jesus. They're not ashamed of Jesus. They're not ashamed of saying his name. They're not ashamed of singing about him. The Antichrist will absolutely be death on anybody who even mentions the name of Jesus. But they continue to just proclaim Jesus. And the simplicity, the profound simplicity that is in Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 was concerned. He was concerned that his fellow believers in Corinth were going to be secularized and move away from the simplicity that there is, really is in Jesus Christ. Verse number 3, 2 Corinthians 11 verse 3. I fear lest by any means, just as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. We love to make the Christian life so complicated. We love to really make everything so complicated when in fact the simple gospel, so profound and yet so powerful, I remind you this morning, it does not get any deeper than trusting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and making Him your master. It doesn't get any deeper than that. Are you loyal to Jesus? These saints will be. Am I a soldier of the cross, a follower of the Lamb? And shall I fear to own His cause or blush to speak His name? Must I be carried to skies on flowery beds of ease? While others fought to win the prize and sail through bloody seas. Sure, I must fight if I would reign. Increase my courage, Lord. I'll bear the toil. I'll endure the pain. Supported by thy word. They were blessed because they were steadfast. They followed the word of God. And they were loyal to Jesus. That's it. That's why they were so blessed. But not only did they live steadfastly. Here's another bullet point. They die strongly. Amen. They die strong. Amen. Now that sounds kind of strange, really. Yeah. But it says in verse 13, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord. They die strongly because they die nobly. They die well because they die purposely, richly. What a terrible thing to just kind of slip off and just kind of slip away and everybody even knows you're hardly gone. I want to go out and these folks went out with a flash. I heard from a voice from heaven saying, right. 
Notice it says a heavenly voice rings out. Very likely this heavenly voice, because it doesn't say it's an angel, is very likely it's the Lord himself. Yeah. Jesus himself wanted to proclaim how just how blessed these Bible-believing, loyal people were. And then notice what he says. He says, write it, John. Write it down, John. Don't get distracted. Don't look to do anything else. Write it. That is, faithfully take this down. Because this is a great truth. Blessed are the dead. Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that wonderful resurrection chapter, said, Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? There is no sting in death for a born-again believer. And there's certainly no sting in death for these tribulation saints. The prospect of heaven doesn't frighten a real believer. Now, the process of death certainly might. Uh -huh. I must admit, I'm not looking forward to that. And like many have said, I say this morning as well, you can't scare me with heaven. You can't scare me with heaven. And this will not be just a one-off moment. Look at this verse. It says, it's not just a one-time happening. Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. This is not a just a one-time, yeah, just you tribulation saints who get this special little blessing. No, anybody who dies in the Lord and for the Lord gets all these wonderful blessings. And then notice the amazing response. Look what the Bible says. It says, the Holy Spirit says, yes, yay, saith the Spirit. <laughs> yay, meaning yes, the Spirit Notice the big capital there. That's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit says, yes, <laughs> just like we might say, yes, God, the Holy Spirit proclaims, yes, I want these saints dead. You'd say, what? That's exactly what he's saying. He's saying, yes. Why? Because he is tired of seeing his loved ones hurt. He is tired of seeing the devil and the antichrist and the beast attacking these saints of God. He said, that's it. Done. They're out of here. He sees their tears and their sorrows. And he said, yes, they get to come to heaven. What a blessing. And they are granted that a special blessing. And he gives them two blessings along with that. Number one, they are granted rest. Look what it says, that they may rest from their labors. They rest from their labors. Now, sometimes we as believers think we work so hard. I mean, sometimes even coming to church seems so hard. And I must admit, getting up and even getting to church with these kind of storms is kind of challenging me. I will say that. But folks, the fact of the matter is we don't even really know what real work is. We sometimes think it's tough if we miss just one section of a revolving door at the store. Or if we have to walk an extra 10 feet at at the Costco parking lot. Oh, this is so terrible. <laughs> and then we look at our fellow believers in Ukraine. Wonderful men, women of God, children who don't even have a warm coat for their back. That's right. And I will tell you folks, we need to realize we have, we rarely suffer like a certain, I mean, not any of us suffer like these tribulation saints. They will be constantly on the brink of starvation. They will be chased and hunted down to death. But when they die, rest. Rest. Hallelujah. Have you ever felt like, man, I'm just tired? Mm -hmm. Heaven is rest. Oh, I tell you what, I'm just so sick and tired of sickness. Guess what? Heaven is rest. Oh, I just wish I could have a, I just feel so upset, my so emotions. Rest. Heaven is rest. It is rest. The Holy Spirit says, yes, you get to come and we're going to spend all of eternity together. Yes, the Holy Spirit says. I'll say yes, Lord. They are blessed because they're granted rest. But number two, they are blessed because they are promised reward. Look at verse 13. Their works, the word is ergos, deeds. We get our word like ergonomic. Their deeds follow them. Their service to the Lord. God sees 
everything anybody does for the Lord. In Matthew chapter 25 and verse 40, the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Insomuch as ye have done unto the one, the least of these, my brethren, you've done it for me. That cup of cold water you did in Jesus' name, he said, I see that as a blessing to me. That cooling of a fevered brow, dear mom, that cleaning of a house so your family can be safe and healthy, time and time and time again, just to get dirty again. God says, I see every work you do, every time you clean that carpet, every time you go there and wipe up all that stuff from people being sick, I see it, I watch it. Father, you working 12 hours so that your child can go to a Christian school or so that your wife can home educate, those who practice instruments hour by hour so they can serve the Lord, those who here build and those who pass out tracts and work in all the different things. Folks, God sees every little thing done. This morning I called one of our workers at six something. I said, good morning. And then I went, yes, it's another Sunday without power. And, uh, you know what? Thank God for people who say, we'll do it. We'll take care of it. Our dear folks have the ability to get some portable outhouses here. So, by the way, you can use those. That's for you out there. But uh, why, why does God do all this? Why does God say all oh, you get rest? And why does he say he will see everything? Because he's in a covenant with us. And when he's in a covenant, he never breaks that covenant. You know, there are a lot of relationships that we have that are basically contracts. You know, we uh, go to the store, we get a cell phone, we have a contract. We go and rent or we have a mortgage or whatever, we have a contract. There are a lot of spoken and real contracts. There are some unspoken ones, like a, like a doctor, you know. If you say, I'll be there at such and such a time. If you go, good. If you don't, he's not going to call you. He doesn't care. He's not going to check up on you. Contracts basically are made to be broken, but covenants are different. God is in a covenant with us. That's what happens when I get saved. The moment I get saved, I enter into a blood covenant with the God of the universe. In fact, His name Jehovah is a covenant name. That's why when God says, my name is Jehovah Yeri, the providing God, that's a covenant. That's not just a contract. It might work. No, it will work. He is in a covenant. You see, a parent is in a covenant with a child. They have a duty of care. Every parent is responsible to make sure that his child eats. If your child doesn't show up for dinner, you can't just say, oh, right, whatever. No, you have to go find them. You have to make sure they show up. You are going to eat. It is my duty of care. I'm in a covenant. I'm a parent. God says, I'm in a covenant with you. I promise you. Whatever you've done, whatever you will do, I will, I've will. i got that covered and I will see that and he will bless that. He said, your works follow you. I never have forgotten one work. I'm in a covenant with you. I see it. I sense it. I will mark it down. Anything you've done for Jesus, you just know it's going to be blessed. That's a powerful truth right there. Now let's move into the second half. We've talked about the blessing of God. Now we're going to talk about the crushing of God. The second half of this last part here, the Holy Spirit finishes with a very serious warning. It is time now for God to step up. And He's going to do as He says in Psalms chapter 2. Perhaps you've read that psalm where it says that God is going to laugh at His enemies. This is that time. He is going to laugh not with glee, but with holy, happy justice being done. This is breaking time. This is trampling time. This is crushing time. In verses 14 through 16, the first crushing is that of a, a harvest of grain. And then in verses 17 through 20, it's a crushing of grapes. And so first of all, 
Let's look at now, this is major point number two, the crushing. Number one was the blessing. This is number two, the crushing. And the first bullet point is the grain harvest. Verses 14 and following. This is judgment day. Look at verse 14. In fact, let's read it together, would you please? All right, let's read it all out now. Here, verse 14. Ready, begin. And I looked and beheld a light cloud. And upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. John sees reaping day, judgment day. He says, I looked. He saw Jesus because he looked. Are you looking? Christian lives should be always looking for the Lord and looking. Keep your eyes on the eastern gate. The old gospel song says, are you looking? He's coming. Psalm 24, verse 7. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and lift ye up, ye everlasting doors. And the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Even lift them up, ye everlasting doors. And the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. God said that he looked and saw the Son of Man. It says, and behold. That's a breathtaking sense. Behold, I saw a white cloud. The New Testament speaks of the second coming of Christ being so glorious and associated with clouds. Now, I can tell you, I've seen some amazing displays of clouds. Here in the valley, we get to see some amazing sunsets, especially over Mount Diablo every once in a while. It's just unbelievable. Or perhaps you've been at the coast and seen the sunset there at Carmel. It's just amazing. But I will tell you, this is like nothing we've ever seen. It says, and the one that was sitting on the throne was like, Unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown. Notice it says that he is one like unto the Son of Man. This is Jesus as a reaper. This is the Messiah. You'd say, well, why does it say like the Son of Man? Well, when it calls him the Son of Man, it's not meaning he wasn't God. It's just meaning he was God in the flesh. He's incarnate. He was the Son of Man. He was also the Son of God. But then it says, like. People sometimes say, well, why does it say it's like the Son of God? Well, you know what? I frankly have no idea why God chooses to use some of the wording he does. But it doesn't bother me one bit. At least, actually. I don't care what God says about that. It's the fact that I just believe that he says, this is in fact the Son of God. This is none other than Jesus, our Messiah. I definitely commiserate with poet Mark Twain when he said, It is not the things which I do not understand in the Bible which trouble me, but the things which I do understand. So why it says like unto the Son of Man, or it doesn't just say it is the Son of Man, it doesn't make any difference. Whatever the case is, he is in clouds, it's glorious, it's an amazing scene, and on his head is a golden crown. Now the Greek word there is not the normal Greek word for a crown, which is diadem, reflecting of that of a king, but it is the word Stephanus, or victor's crown. Here we see the Son of Man prevailing. That's why he is crushing his enemies. Notice in the in this scene here, he has in his hand a sharp sickle. A sickle is not a normal tool that we would see very often. It is more in the third world countries, even today, they certainly use that. But it is a, has a long handle on it. It has a large, curved, sharpened blade at the bottom. It sweeps through the grain at a very low level. And that is exactly what God is saying here, that God is going to cut down the sinful people. He's going to cut down this world. He's not going to miss anything. It's going to be very close to the ground. Today, in our modern society, our ever-increasing, evil, socialist society, there's so much wickedness, and we get so grieved, and we think, can't something stop it? It will. 
That sickle is coming. God says he's going to cut it, and he's going to cut it. Right. A sharp sickle. Jesus is the reaper. Jesus himself is the one who is going to reap this world. And then another scene in verse 15. Now we have a fourth angel. The first three were in the first half of the chapter. Verse 15, and another angel came out of the temple. Another meeting, the first three were in the first half of the chapter. Crying with a loud voice unto him that sat on the cloud, the son of man who's sitting on the cloud, <laughs> thrust in thy sickle. So God the Father gives the go-ahead to God the Son, and he uses this angel as a go-between. Thrust in the sickle and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And I will tell you, in my opinion, the earth is ripe right now. It is ripe to the point of rottenness. I pray, Jesus, come. Because it seems like the only thing that's going to stop all the craziness out there is for Jesus to come. But for some reason, God waits. And that's what it says here. He waits until the earth is ripe. And I would sense that it's ripe right now, but I will tell you, I'm glad that God knows what's going on, but there will be payday Sunday. And here we see that this angel comes right out of the temple. Notice it says he comes out of the temple. That's heaven. Remember now, every the tabernacle and the earthly temple are actually patterned after a heavenly tabernacle, a heavenly temple, or heaven itself. It says they cry with a loud voice. So this angel is crying with a loud voice because it has authority, urgency, power. And to him that sat on the cloud, put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come. No more delay. It's done. Now is the time. I've read many a time that passage in Acts chapter 17. The amazing Apostle Paul was in Greece. He's there in Athens, standing at Mars Hill. And he's talking to all those educated people and all the people around there. And he reminded them, listen, Acts chapter 17 and verse 30, the times of this ignorance, God winked at. It doesn't mean God didn't care. It just means that God waited. God winked. He just kept waiting. <laughs> I, I look at that and I say, oh God, why are you waiting? But now commands men everywhere to repent. And now look at this tragic verse back in Roman, or in Revelations 14, verse 16. And he that sat on a cloud thrust in his sickle into the earth, and the earth was reaped. My friend, listen to that verse. The earth was reaped. The earth was reaped. Reaping day is coming. Go ahead, evil and corrupt government, providing resources to slaughter millions of innocent children. Reaping day is coming. Go ahead, wicked media, doing your best to destroy the wholesome morals of our precious children. You need to know something. Reaping day is coming. And the earth was reaped. And the earth was reaped. And the earth was reaped. The Bible says all weeds will be destroyed. And the wheat will be taken to heaven. A devastating judgment day. A devastating reaping. Then without even a break, he just moves from this harvest of grain to a grape harvest. Verse 17. Now we move into the grape harvest. And so this would be point number two underneath our crushing. First was the grain harvest, the last days. Now we have the grape harvest, Armageddon. And that's really what he's speaking about. As we'll see in a moment, he's actually beginning the beginning stages of the great battle of Armageddon. Notice we have a fifth angel now in verse 17. And another angel. The fourth angel told the Son of Man to put a sickle into the earth. And now a fifth angel. Verse 17. And another angel came out of the temple. Again, from heaven. Which is in heaven. He also having a sharp sickle. Most conservative Bible teachers believe this is the beginning of the Armageddon. It is a very sharp sickle. 
And the reason for this, uh, we, they think, is because, as it says, the blood is going to flow as high as the horse's breath. You have heard, perhaps, all roads lead to heaven. No, my friend, all roads don't lead to heaven, but they do lead to judgment. Either the judgment of the just or that of the unjust. And these verses certainly confirm that. And so we have the fifth angel as the reaper. Now we have a sixth angel in verse 18. And so, again, this is the messenger. The fifth angel is the reaper. The fifth angel, sixth angel, excuse me, is the messenger. Verse 18. And another angel came out of the altar. So now we have seen six angels... God seems to work in sevens, threes, oftentimes in the book of Revelation. And we're going to see that angel. Verse 18, and another angel came out from the altar, which had power over the fire. Ah, we have a little different angel here. Power over the fire, meaning the fire of incense uh, in the temple. Cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth. For her grapes are fully ripe. Now, he comes from the altar of fire, the altar of incense that constantly has fire. A little background here you may remember from reading the Old Testament passages there in the law, the earthly tabernacle and then the temple later, twice a day, once in the morning, once in the evening, the priest would go to the brazen altar and get a fiery coal he would take it and put it in his censer. He would take it there and take it to the altar of incense. And so the people could be outside the tabernacle, outside the temple, and they could see constantly the smoke going up, which was a symbol of the prayers of God's people, the prayers of the priests going up to heaven, and God receiving them. Here, this angel comes, and all the prayers of all the people that have been martyred, all the prayers of the saints for all the ages, really, God has heard them, and now he is going to thrust in his sharp sickle. The Bible says he is going to sever, sever every wicked grape from its earthly existence. Notice what it says in verse 19, and we see the winepress of the judgment of God. Verse 19, and the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. Ancient wine presses were large vats, usually made out of stone. They would throw the grapes into there. They would roll over it with some instrument or even stomp on it. It would then go in a little trough to a lower vessel where it would then collect. And it would flow. The grapes now, the red grape juice, really would look something like blood. Verse 20. And the winepress was trodden without the city. And blood, that is the blood of the grape, the juice of the grape, but in the sense really for our symbol, it is in fact blood, came out of the winepress. So this is God's winepress. This is the winepress of judgment. God is going to be stomping and crushing and putting his sickle to the grape. Notice what it says. That the blood is going to come out of the wine press, even under the horse's bridle, by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. That's an old English wording, meaning about 180 to 200 miles. And by the way, roughly about the uh, length of north south of Israel. It says that blood is going to flow as high as a horse's bridle, approximately four feet high. Four feet blood in a trough, basically what it seems like. Who knows, for 180 miles? It is hard to imagine such a thing. How is it possible for there to be so much blood flowing in this trough or whatever it ends up being, or if it's just meaning spattered up four feet high? Whatever the case, there's going to be so much blood, it's just going to be a terrible situation. But then, when you begin to read what Scripture says about this Armageddon battle and how there are going to be millions and millions and millions of people from all over the earth that descend in this one 
big, long valley. Maybe, in fact, there might be some sort of a drainage ditch that is four feet deep, full of blood. Well, when we come to chapter 16 of Revelation and chapter 19, we'll delve more detailed into that. But for now, let's look for a few moments as the time we have left at this battle of Armageddon. This is where it would really be nice to be able to show you an illustration I had from Dr. J. Jeremiah. He was a great uh, scholar of end times. But in Zechariah chapter 14, verse number 2, the Old Testament of Zechariah said, I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. All nations of the earth will come against Jerusalem. In fact, in Ezekiel chapter 39, it says it'll take seven months into the whatever period of time, whether it's even into the millennium, to bury the dead and all the weapons of warfare. Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse 7 says, Alas, for that day is so great, there is none like it. Daniel chapter 12 verse 1 says, There shall be such a time of trouble such as never were. 2,500 years ago, in Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 38, excuse me, God gave Ezekiel specific events, a long list of nations that are going to attack Israel. And so, uh, if you would turn there with me to Ezekiel chapter 38, and we're going to spend uh, the balance of our time there with a few other little references. We're going to see now, and I'm going to kind of give you a picture, a word picture of this map. I want you to look at the, uh, the Mediterranean uh, basin there. I want you to see Israel there, and Egypt beneath it, and all the nations around it. I want you to see Europe and see Northern Africa. So just for a few moments, we're going to watch as all the world, and the West is going to come as well, the Bible teaches us that these different groups, different names than we would call them today, and yet when you piece them together, uh, scholars say that they are in fact very clearly identified. Ezekiel 38, verse number 1, And the word of the Lord came to me. Ah, uh, that's good. God has given the word. Verse 2, Son of man, set thy face against Gog. Apparently Gog is uh, the... Uh, some leader, the land of Magog, the chief prince. Now in the Hebrew, that is the word Ros, or R-O-S-H. Most believe that that is the word for Russia. It says the chief prince, Rosh, of Meshek, or Mesek, and that, most believe that that is Moscow, and Tuba. Dr. Schofield, the wonderful Schofield Bible, I believe that's the, uh, the Russian city of Tobolsk, and prophesy against him. Notice it clarifies a little further where these people come from. Verse 15. And thou shalt come from thy place out of the north. And so right now we have a northern army called Rosh from Meshach, Gog, who's the leader, and called Magog, they are going to come from the north. That is, by the way, Magog is one of the sons, Noah's grandsons. In Genesis chapter 10 and verse number 2, most people who study the, uh, the I should say scholars who study where Noah's sons ended up believe that the son of Magog, were those who ended up, uh, it would be uh, east of the Caspian Sea and the Black Sea, all those stand states, Uzbekistan and all those different ones, and Afghanistan, all of those are connected to the armies of the north. And so Magog, or those from that area, Rosh, meaning Russia, and Meshach, meaning Moscow, so the northern armies are going to come. Then Ezekiel 38, verse number 5, Persia is going to come. So Persia is going to attack Israel. 
1935, Persia changed its name to Iran. Today, Russia and their strongest ally is Iran. And they are both hateful of Israel. This alliance will continue in the final days. So the armies of the north, also Persia. Then God says that Ethiopia is going to come as well. In that Genesis chapter 10, verse number 6, Noah's grandson, Ethiopia, was founded by Cush. You'll see that in Genesis chapter 10, verse number 6. Ancient Ethiopia is represented by land south of Egypt. Today, that region is the modern country of Sudan, another declared enemy of Israel. Then, Libya, the Bible says, is going to come against Israel, occupying to the land west of Egypt, the interesting thing about Libya is it retains the same name as it has for the last 3,000 years or more. Their official religion, like so many of them, especially the ones there, some of the armies of the north and Iran, is Islam. Libya is constant contact with Russia. They have uh, trying to get their armaments so that they can attack others. And then the Bible also says that Gomer is going to come. G-O-M-E-R. These are all found in Genesis or in Ezekiel chapter 38. You can just kind of find them there. Most uh, many scholars believe that uh, Gomer is also known as Germany because of the similarity of their names. That would then mark a nation from the west. We have the northern armies, we have the northern eastern armies, we have Persia, we have Sudan from the south, we have Libya from the south to the west. Now we have the west, Germany. And then it says to Garma, or which is Turkey, one of Noah's great grandsons in Genesis chapter 10 and verse number 3, migrated to the area which is now known as Turkey. Ezekiel places this in Ezekiel chapter 38 and verse number 6 also in the north corners. Turkey is, as you know, Islamic. Folks, this is a very dark picture for Israel. When you think about it, the north, the northeast, the south, the southwest, the west. Folks, it is, when I look at this, I just said, no wonder the blood is going to flow as high as a horse's bridle. There are millions that are going to come there. Russia and Turkey will lead from the north. Iran from the east to Sudan and Libya from the south. Perhaps Germany from the west. Now there does appear to be one interesting prerequisite before they do that. Ezekiel chapter 38 verse number 11 says Israel will be markedly different than it is today. And thou shalt say, I will go up to a land of unwalled villages. What? A land of unwalled villages? That certainly isn't Israel today. I mean, you go down the street in Jerusalem or just about anywhere, you'll see many people with those M16s thrown over their shoulders. I mean, that is not a, they are very uh, defense-minded. Something will happen where Israel lets down its defenses, I will go to them that are at rest, they that dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls, having neither bars nor gates, when Russia and all of his allies attacks Israel, they are going to be disarmed. Hard to imagine, but the Bible says that's exactly what's going to happen. What hope then is there for Israel? I thought all Israel is going to be saved. Well, it is. Because here's what God says he does and. Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 18. God raises himself up, and it shall come to pass at the same time when God shall come against the land of Israel, saith the Lord God, that my fury shall come up in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath, folks, this is that wine press. This is that wine press of wrath that God says, I'm going to leash out on this earth. Surely in that day there shall be a great shaking. A great shaking in the land of Israel. Apparently, somehow, 
God is going to defeat all these millions of armies in Israel. And it's going to be so horrendous that the blood is going to flow as high as a horse's bridle. Now, as we look at all these things, it's very dramatic. It's very uh, amazing. We look and we wonder about it. Some might be taken back. Others might feel this, that sense of holy justice. But whatever the case, I think for me, what it does is it makes me realize what our job is. Many people feel helpless, like they can't do anything. Folks, this just reminds us again, God's got this thing. He has got this thing under control. And the answer for us is not to just throw up our hands and say, oh, there's no use. No, God wants us to keep giving that blessed gospel. Here's what I personally believe. I believe the hope for America, the hope for the world, is to raise up thriving churches and Christian schools and Christian homes, like here at the home church, in every town, in every region, in every city, in every county, in every state, in every country. These little pockets of revival, these places where there's safety and you don't have to listen to all the junk of the world. Prophecies like this remind us that our job is to do what we can to love the Word of God as these precious saints of God. They loved the commandments of God. They stood firm, unashamed of Jesus Christ. My friend, when it looks like there's no hope, there's always hope. Because as God reminds us, when God steps in, it changes everything. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed here this morning.